The theme of this session is promoting a more inclusive and equitable economic recovery uh, in ASEAN. Uh, we have uh, three well-known speakers uh, deliberating on the topic. The first speaker is Dr. Chua Hak Bin, who is currently a senior economist at Maybank Kim Eng. Uh, the second speaker is Dr. Sanchita Basudas, Associate Fellow, Regional Economic Studies Program at our institute. And the third speaker is Mr. Sebastian, Sebastian Cortez Sanchez. Uh, and Dr. Chua will be speaking on the ASEAN Economic, uh, Regional Economic Outlook. Sanchita will talk about uh, regional economic integration approach to strengthen uh, ASEAN economic recovery. And Sebastian will talk about the rise of digital trade and SME development in ASEAN. Each speaker will take about 15 minutes uh, to do their presentation, and this will be followed by a Q&A session. I would encourage um, attendees to uh, please uh, post your question using the Q&A function as the presentation is being rolled out because uh, we do not have time probably to answer all the questions. So the, the sooner you post, the, the greater the chance uh, your question being uh, answered by the panelists. Without further ado, let me uh, invite uh, Hakbin to begin his presentation, please. Thank you, Dr. Casey. Uh, thanks, Mr. Choi and Isis for this opportunity uh, to present um, Maybank's views. Let me just drop the slides. So I guess the theme, you know, um, is about the recovery and about inclusive growth, but it's been a rather divergent recovery this year. Uh, we've seen a reopening in the US and Europe, and that's driving global growth. But I think pretty much Asia and ASEAN has been behind in terms of reopening and as well as the vaccine rollout. Uh, starting to catch up, and I think uh, 2022 is starting to look better for ASEAN. Uh, there's been massive fiscal packages, uh, and a sharp global recovery has took U.S. inflation, but even the U.S. In inflation trends around the world has been kind of K-shaped. Um, not, not many countries here are seeing uh, inflation pressures intensify as yet. Uh, but because of this uh, kind of lopsided growth, the Fed is moving to tighten earlier, probably earlier than what emerging markets would have liked. Uh, but it looks like the QE tapering will start in November, running down by 15 billion a month. And by June of next year, uh, the QE should have been fully unwind. That's our view. And the US will start hiking rates in the fourth quarter next year. Um, there is concern whether ASEAN will see the kind of taper tantrums that we witnessed in 2013, where we saw big sell offs in both the currency and the markets, almost comparable to that that we've seen a recession. But we think that. Um, ASEAN is not immune, but I think uh, you know, given the stronger positions like the current account surpluses, uh, the larger foreign exchange reserves, and probably the more limited foreign capital inflows in the preceding year, I think suggests any seller will probably be a lot more modest. The recovery speed um, diverges and, and um, has been very different across, but I think um, with some of vaccination rates catching up, we should see some growth converge you know, going to next year. Easy monetary policy will stay for this year, but I think we also expect uh, the central banks to start tightening next year. Singapore in April next year is our view. And then uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines will start hiking the fourth quarter alongside the Fed. But really, there's a tapering and uh, withdrawal of the fiscal support programs. And that's, uh, that's in some sense a bit of a negative. Uh, there are plenty of risks out there. Yeah. There's, uh, concept of herd immunity is kind of elusive when, you have a, when you're dealing with a more infectious Delta variant. So even achieving an 80% vaccination rate doesn't mean that the starts and stops has, uh, is completely over. That's the taper tantrums, but are now also a more recent risk is the risk of a China, a sharp China slowdown um, that could um, hit ASEAN as well, especially the more trade reliant and of course the fading fiscal. I'll just run through some key slides, but uh, I just want to show this slide because it gives a sense of how hard it is to forecast growth this year, you know, and then pretty much you see the revisions, only Singapore saw an upgrade, 6.8%, but pretty much across the whole ASEAN region, we've seen growth downgrades uh, very sharply in Thailand, which is very dependent on tourism. Uh, that's, you know, so our forecast is only 1.4% this year. And then in Vietnam, which was a rock star last year, you know, 
kind of escape recession, but we saw a sharp contraction in the third quarter. So um, I will move long inflation. I think it's just stirring, but uh, hasn't been that much of an issue. I think we are expecting inflation to pick up next year, uh, more, the, more visibly given the rising energy and food prices, some supply chain disruptions, and of course, the, from the weak economic reopening. Uh, policy rate, I've, uh, so this kind of gives you the trajectory of ASEAN growth rates. It's really uh, Vietnam first out of the door, you know, it's never really went into recession last year. Indonesia actually um, in second place, simply because Indonesia never really locked down as hard. So I, I guess it's a big country, and um, very fortunate now of cases are actually falling down quite sharply. So they've uh, gone hit with uh, reopening despite uh, despite some lower vaccination rates. And then it will be next would be Singapore, and of course lagging behind would be uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and last would be Philippines. Uh, ASEAN was in a Delta hotspot, but I think cases are falling and now easing, allowing for some lock, easing of lockdowns. I think this Google Mobility Index gives you a sense of the recovery in economic activities. Um, here you can see that actually um, with some of the reopening in recent weeks, Indonesia has really shot up and it's um, in terms of, uh, you know, Apple mobility in terms of driving is actually way above pre-pandemic levels. Malaysia has just started to recover. Um, more recently, Singapore is kind of flat you know, with the introduction of the dining to dining in and also some of the stricter type of bringing back of the work from home. Uh, but the good news is that on the bottom, the countries that were really hard hit, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines of late has actually seen a somewhat sharp recovery as well. So I think uh, for the most part, it's uh, good news and we hope this uh, trajectory continues. Just to give you a sense that the correlation of GDP growth and the depth of recession is very much tied to this uh, lockdowns and this loss in mobility, you know, which affects the domestic uh, activity. Uh, the harder you lock down, you know, the, the harder your contraction. What about a vaccination uh, drive so far? Well, we all know that Singapore is uh, in a pretty good uh, spot, um, almost 83% of the population having at least uh, one vaccine dose. Uh, Malaysia is catching up. Malaysia is um, about 72% now with at least one vaccine. I think about 65% with full two vaccines. Um, and like Mihan, Thailand 42, Vietnam 34, uh, and um, you know, behind is Indonesia Philippines. So that gives you a sense. Um, there's still a bit of catch up. On the right-hand side, I think the encouraging news that you can see some of the vaccination rates has actually been accelerating in recent months. Uh, so Malaysia is not that far away uh, from catching up to, to, um, to Singapore. I think uh, encouragingly, Thailand has really stepped up in the last few months or so, the blue line, and it's caught up uh, quite dramatically. So we're actually looking for Thailand to get to achieve 70% vaccination rate by January uh, next year at this rate. And then next in line will be Indonesia and then uh, Philippines, but it's Vietnam, which is the dotted line, which has kind of surprised a bit and really has stepped up. So Vietnam is now starting to overtake uh, Indonesia and the Philippines. Uh, so these are some of our projections in terms of the vaccination timelines. And I think for most part, we've been bringing forward to early next year. And by the first half of next year, I think most of the ASEAN countries would have achieved 70% uh, vaccination rate. And I think uh, hopefully this will open a door, you know, for some of the opening of borders between ASEAN countries, because as you've seen so far, the vaccinated you know, travel lanes uh, has not applied to any of the ASEAN countries, for example. Uh, the vaccination rates tend to be much higher in the cities and the tourism spots than, uh, than the, uh, the regions that are further afield. So here you can see Jakarta pretty much, you know, uh, fully vaccinated, Bali as well. And, um, and Bangkok and Phuket, but the other provinces are still kind of lagging behind. I guess the dilemma of dealings with uh, much uh, larger countries. I just want to give the sets uh, that compare the difference between this recession and the past recessions. That you know, usually ASEAN is hurt by a collapse in external demand, which hurts exports and therefore hits the manufacturing side. Uh, but this time is a bit different, right? This time is really because of the lockdowns uh, and you know the the restrictions on domestic activity, which hits the services side a lot harder. And you can see here the red, you know, in, in terms of the services column, that's really, um, that's really hit. Uh, and especially the larger economies, which have a larger services component, like the Philippines, Indonesia, and, and also Thailand. Um, so I, 
I think what was, um, I guess, pleasantly uh, looking back is, um, is that manufacturing wasn't really hit as hard, hard or as long, right? Because I think in the past, the duration of manufacturing contraction would have been a lot sharper. But what has happened is that manufacturing has bounced back very, very strongly. Um, and it's really tied to, you know, whether you allow the factories to keep on running and whether the, you could contain the spread of the COVID to the, to the factories. Uh, of late, you know, about two months back, especially the PMIs across ASEAN actually plunged below 50, a lot went to contraction because the COVID did affect the factories and factories were shut down, running at half capacity at you know, Malaysia, Vietnam, especially. Uh, the good news is that the PMIs are starting to rebound and uh, expect for the next month, at least some of the PMIs for manufacturing across ASEAN will, will be above 50. Singapore has basically stayed above 50. So it's a, that's a good sign. Uh, this just gives you a sense of the contraction in the export side. When you compare to the past recessions, the duration of that very short, brief period of contraction uh, was remarkably short, looking back. So I think that's been the saving grace that's helped to cushion the, the impact from this, uh, from this pandemic. So on the other, um, I guess, uh, unusual kind of aspects is that the capital flows as well. Right? In terms of financial flow, the money going to tech investments was, for example, wasn't really that badly interrupted, right? It only fell slightly last year. So, you know, with the digitalization, as Minister spoke, spoke about, and accelerating exponentially, uh, sort of funds could still go to companies that were expanding. Um, the other interesting thing is also the foreign reserves, which, you know, in past crises and recessions, there tends to be some pressure for financial outflows. Uh, this time, it didn't really happen. The foreign reserves kept on rising, and actually quite dramatically since the start of the pandemic. It's risen more than 100, 100 billion for, for ASEAN, and uh, some big increases and in jumps in foreign reserves include Singapore, but also Thailand, and even decent sums, you know, like um, about 15, 20 billion for Indonesia. I guess highlighting some of risks um, is that you know, even, you know, I think maybe it's start of the year, we all hope that the vaccination will be the, will be the silver bullet. Uh, but it's clear that even the more infection delta variant, that even after we reach the vaccination rate of 80%, um, it helps reduce fatalities, but not necessarily the number of infections. And that has still, I think, kept um, you know, countries on, on edge. And, and the same for Singapore. So I think that's something we still have to deal with. Um, the taper tantrums, and I suppose in high inflation, is uh, for sourcing a... Uh, the US to tighten, you know, earlier than what I think emerging markets would have liked or what ASEAN would have liked because a lot of ASEAN countries have not fully recovered to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, as you can see here, inflation in the US, you know, uh, headline 5 percent you know, cause 4 percent And for many of ASEAN countries, uh, surprisingly low in Asia, low 2 percent um, and, and Malaysia. In, in part because of the very weak labor market recovery that has kept which pressure, you know, uh, which price pressures are uh, in check. In, uh, and just to give you a sense of the comparing that since the Fed is going to be tightening quite soon, what, uh, what the 2013 uh, scenario was, because uh, in that time when the, when the Fed started taping QE and started uh, you know, the prospects of rising rates, there was a massive sell-off in the stocks, as you can see the red line here across uh, ASEAN, uh, and as well as the currency. Right. Indo fell 23%, currency fell 16%, so that's, uh, that's pretty painful. Um, in Thailand as well. So far, uh, markets have been kind of divergent this year, really corresponding to the degree of lockdowns and how fast you can open economic activity and whether you also benefited from this global uh, trade recovery. You know? So markets in Vietnam, Singapore has uh, done pretty well, whereas, uh, uh, and the only um, currency that really saw a lot of pressure is actually Thai baht so far, down 11% for the year in part because of Thailand's very high dependence on the tourism sector, and clearly tourism is not going to come back anytime soon, because even the reopening, um, you know, the border controls are really the last to, to, to be relaxed. Uh, this just gives you a sense of the positioning of foreigners into the markets, and I just want to highlight very quickly that in 2020, there wasn't that much money coming into ASEAN, so I think the positioning is actually quite like money went to China, right, or India, and I think that's where the position is heavy and more vulnerable. And by clearly in 2013, you can see that ASEAN was kind of in, was coming out of bull market in 2012 when both uh, foreign fund, fund flows in both the stocks and also bonds were actually quite, uh, quite massive. You know? So I think that's kind of set the stage for a pass, more massive pullout. 
Uh, the foreign position in terms of equities, which is left-hand side chart, is pretty low now in ASEAN. Well, some countries is near historical lows. Uh, for bonds as well, has uh, has uh, stabilized. They've actually been uh, you know, coming off. Uh, we are mindful of the rising food energy prices. Uh, they remain a risk. Uh, here you can see both the food prices, UN food price index, up to the three percent from a year ago, but also energy prices starting to uh, creep up quite a bit. Uh, Asia is a net all importer, especially in Northeast Asia. Uh, fortunately, some of the ASEAN countries are commodity exporters, so they tend to benefit. You know, Malaysia is a um, is a is a is a gas. Uh, and also a small net oil exporter. Uh, Indonesia is a net oil importer, but is a gas LNG exporter. So that helps uh, cushion some impact from the rising uh, oil prices. Um, again, I think, you know, at the start of the year, I thought that the uh, freight rates, the disruptions to container ships and ports would have been uh, abating by now. Yeah, clearly I was wrong. And um, the price of uh, shipping something from uh, Shanghai to LA, for example, is more than five times, 500% uh, than what it was a year ago. Uh, the chip shortage has also meant that the uh, chip prices have been rising. And remember, you know, Moore's law suggests that actually for the same technology, chip prices tend to decline um, over time. And this has not been the case. You know? And this has clearly affected uh, production of probably your handphones or also cars. Uh, we're hoping for some chip shortages. I think there are some signs that this may be starting to ease. I think the third risk has kind of emerged recently is more China, that China is uh, cracking down hard on the tech sector. China is cracking down hard on the real estate lending and, um, and, uh, and, and also some of the coal production, yeah, which has led to a power crunch. So it looks as if China's growth could um, slow quite a bit in the coming year. Uh, and just bear in mind that ASEAN is not totally immune. China is ASEAN's largest export market, accounting for more than 20% now of exports, and uh, you know, far, far larger than the US, as you can see from China, right? And of course, Northeast Asia is more sensitive, but really Singapore, Thailand, and Malaysia could see a you know, 0.6 to 0.5 percentage point shaved off as well if China does slow quite a bit. Uh, I think also China's zero COVID policy kind of sets it apart as well, which also means that uh, because of how infectious the Delta variant is, that surprisingly China could be more at risk of starts and stops next year compared to ASEAN. Right? Uh, even though China has a, a very high vaccination rate, China is not tolerating any kind of uh, COVID cases. And with, as we've seen in recent uh, months, you know, there's just one case in port, you know, they, crack, they, they, they lock down the whole port and that will lead to some supply chain disruptions. Uh, but also, it also means that the pre-pandemic kind of China Tourism boom that we saw in ASEAN is not going to materialize as well. China comes from more than 28% of the tourism arrivals you know, in 2018, 2019, before this pandemic struck. And, um, and as you see from the travel, uh, yeah, domestic travel is almost back to pre-pandemic levels, but international travel in China is uh, close to zero. And of course, I think uh, there's concerns about China's uh, excessive debt. Total debt has come to more than 300% of GDP. Uh, the concentration of debt that's reduced reason dramatically is actually known on the corporate debt. That's the red line in the middle. It's more than 200% of GDP. We've seen uh, you know, some of the property companies starting to uh, default. Uh, China has been cracking down on some of the shadow banks. So the good news is that over the last few years, the shadow bank financing has been, uh, has been tamed and starting to contract. And I think this will continue with the uh, crackdown on fintechs. Lastly, um, the diminishing fiscal space is going to be an issue. Uh, I think this is one of the big scars that's left from the pandemic, that the public debt ratios is going to be a big step up from what we were, you know, entering the pandemic. You can see that uh, the big increase, especially in countries like uh, you know, Malaysia is reaching 64%, uh, Philippines, uh, 63%, Indonesia, uh, they've, all, uh, they've all gone up quite dramatically. Uh, you know, and you can see the very big white fiscal deficits. Um, the debt servicing ratio for Indonesia, for example, is almost reaching 20% of government revenue. And that's, uh, you know, that's way above the kind of the guidance threshold uh, that IMF said is about 15%. So, this may limit and constrain the kind of a spending power going forward. And in fact, opens the room whether you know, a lot of governments will have to look at possible tax increases. We've already seen um, in Asia come out with some tax reforms, where the VAT will be increased by 1% actually to 11% and another percent you know, in, uh, to, uh, to, to 12% by 2023. Uh, they also, they've also uh, introduced a small carbon tax. Uh, there's also some uh, changes in the personal income tax bracket for the higher earners. Uh, but I'm, and of course, um, you know, there will be, uh, you know, even Singapore is contemplating the, the GST hike. So 
This table looks more complicated, but what, what we try to do is really look at the fiscal packages that's been announced by all the ASEAN governments. And really some of the headline has been flattered by the fact that they include um, support from the financial sector, stuff, stuff like loan moratoriums, uh, where, where it doesn't really come from the government. And also the loan you still have to repay, but maybe there's an interest waiver for, the, for that uh, defined period. But also some like uh, in Malaysia have also included stuff like uh, money that you can withdraw from the EPF, which also doesn't really come from the government, it comes from, from, the, you know, from the personal savings, right, um, of the individuals. So we try to strip those stuff up and look at the direct government help that's come up from the budget. And that's the second rule. And when you rank this across ASEAN, no surprise that Singapore is the most generous because Singapore had a, you know, had a big reserve, a big fiscal reserve that could tap on to really um, you know, finance the job support scheme and to cushion the impact. So that support is close to 12% of GP. Next would be Thailand, Vietnam. Malaysia's uh, fourth, you know, by our estimates, more than 5%. But really the poor countries, Philippines, Niger, right behind, right? So you can see also this kind of a very uneven growth that really uh, is really the wealthier, richer countries that can afford the fiscal support, whereas the you know, lower income countries having to uh, stretch uh, their limits. Uh, we've seen public debt ratios increase in Malaysia and Thailand, and also um, monetization that really um, Indonesia and Philippines did not have the money. So really who's paying for it? It's the central bank in part. Right. So Bank Indonesia is really committed to continue with 30% financing of the fiscal deficit even going to next year. Philippines doesn't come out with a particular number, but when you estimate how much the, they have purchased uh, their own uh, domestic securities, it's roughly about 80%. Their financing is roughly about 80% of their own deficit. So lastly, I think I'll just leave you this slide. Uh, the endemic novel, is it going to be novel? Uh, can we go back to where it was? I doubt it. So one... I guess more negative view would be that we will suffer from this, this great overhang, uh, high public debt. Uh, one of the scars will limit interest spending and maybe even trigger tax increases. Um, that we are moving into a stage of deglobalization. Minister sp spoke about the manufacturing supply chains moving towards uh, ASEAN. So to, to push towards you know, self sufficiency uh, reliability, resilience rather than pure cost. And supply chains in some sense will uh, move away from China, hopefully to ASEAN, and that's a one plus. The risk of high inflation as governments monetize deficits, as some central banks lose their independence, and of course, the disruptions in supply chain persist with this kind of endemic normal. Um, stricter border controls, US China rivalry, and the new endemic normal you know, will also pose uh, issues. Or you could have a more positive view that once we unlock, we open, there's this pent up demand, um, and um, that will fuel consumer spending. Um, just years and years of low interest rates and prolonged QE will fuel an asset bomb boom, which you know, will also support uh, the wealth effect and support uh, the economy. Uh, there is a view that the, this, uh, we've seen a technological renaissance and digital boom that has been accelerated by the pandemic, and that will continue and puts, uh, puts another growth engine uh, to, to, the, to um, the wins for ASEAN. And of course, uh, there's also a push generally for infrastructure uh, to strengthen productivity uh, trade that will also support growth. So I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to take questions at that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hakbin. Uh, our next presenter will be uh, Sanchita. Sanchita, please proceed. Thank you, uh, Casey. Uh, let me just... Can you see my screen? Yes. Can you put it on uh, full screen mode? Thank you. Just a bit. Okay. Yep, perfect. Thank you, Casey. And um, thank you, ICS and the ASEAN uh, Study Center team for organizing this uh, round table that is now in its 36th year. Uh, I will talk on this topic of regional economic integration for stronger ASEAN economic uh, recovery. Uh, my agenda of my presentation is based on the component of the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework uh, that was endorsed in the ASEAN Summit in November 2020. The framework document had identified uh, five broad strategies, that's health system, uh, human, human security, uh, strengthening regional integration, digital transformation and sustainability and resilience. 
Personally, I see these as connected to each other, like COVID has told us the importance of the health infrastructure. Uh, ASEAN countries suffered a lot due to disruption in education during the pandemic. So we need to see a robust uh, healthcare system and the education system for a stronger regional cooperation that will be undergoing um, changes through digital transformation. And all these together will lead to a sustainable and resilient future. So I will elaborate on each of them, uh, these components, and but of course in selected dimensions and highlighting the way why they are part of this recovery framework document, uh, what the region intends to do in terms of cooperation and identify the gaps that is what they are missing in the current discussion. So to start with, I will talk of the health system and under that it will be mostly on improving uh, vaccine accessibility. So in the chart on the left hand side, what you see is the vaccination progress varies considerably within the region. Of course, Singapore, Cambodia, Malaysia are leading the vaccination drive, but the share of fully vaccinated individual is around 35% or lower in six of the region's economies. And this is largely due to the supply side constraints. There are uh, several uh, challenges uh, to start with. Uh, we have this multilateral initiative called COVAX, which got a lot of um, interest initially from many countries, uh, but soon it faced challenges in terms of financial resources, or there was some supply uh, constraint of vaccines from countries which saw surge in COVID cases uh, with the new variant. ASEAN countries are uh, all importing vaccines mainly from the West, China or India. This means that the region is vulnerable to any delays in the supply of vaccines by the foreign manufacturers. There are also these logistics challenges that's really significant for countries like Indonesia and Philippines that have a big population uh, spread across uh, difficult geographies. Uh, say for uh, in case of Indonesia, the cold, the cold chain logistics are mostly concentrated in Java. So vaccine de deployment outside Java becomes, uh, uh, becomes difficult. Similar challenges exist in countries like Philippines. It is also observed that the rich countries uh, in the region or globally, they are procuring vaccines faster, leaving uh, the less developed countries behind. Finally, uh, what we saw, there are many surveys done that there are vaccine hesitancy among people uh, initially. The hesitancy uh, was not only because of some religious region or perception against certain um, vaccines, but also general thinking that I don't need to travel, so I don't need to get vaccinated. Or there is not data enough currently, so we will wait for the later stages. So, but this is changing, the acceptance rate is growing among the population. Uh, so going uh, the next year, say in 2022, the risk comes from the waning effectiveness of vaccines and how far countries in the region are prepared for the booster doses. So what is ASEAN saying to resolve this issue? Yes, ASEAN has uh, many cooperation mechanisms. I will not read this. These, uh, uh, these mechanisms. Uh, it has some networks on public health issues that's exchanging data across the countries in the region. For vaccine, there is also this regional vaccine security and supply uh, self-resilience program. Uh, but uh, this is still in its early phase and they need to decide on price and procurement plan or the emergency regional stock and stockpiling. There is also the ASEAN uh, response fund which is uh, set up to procure uh, test kits, personal protective equipments, and other medical supplies, or say for the research and development for vaccines. But personally, I see these measures as more as a medium term measures or say future preparedness against pandemic. Uh, for immediate need, I see much depends on the national economies on how they, uh, how they uh, fast track the vaccine deployment or control the outbreaks going forward. Moving to the human security, I will talk on the education that is human resource development. So if you look at the chart on the top left, uh, you will see like from March 2020 to June 2021, 
there were uh, government directed school closures and it was highest for Myanmar and the Philippines, but it was least for say, Singapore, Brunei, Vietnam. Uh, there is, uh, of course, there is remote learning uh, was used for uh, to mitigate some of these school closures. There is a survey done, done by UN agencies and World Bank that says that uh, ASEAN countries, they have used different online platforms like Google Meet, Zoom, websites, even television and radio as a mode of instructions. But what we also observe that accessing online education is not easy for many within ASEAN countries. If you see the top uh, right hand side graph, you will see that ASEAN countries considerably differ in terms of proportion of households with access to internet, computer and mobile devices. So while 90% of households or more in Singapore and Malaysia have access to internet, the same goes down below 50% in case of Cambodia, Lao PDR, Philippines and Vietnam. The gap is as stark as is case of households owning computers. There is another measures for learning adjusted years of school. That's the bottom graph with the orange, uh, orange uh, pillar. So that incorporates both the quantity and quality of education, whereas the blue bar shows the average uh, years of schooling for an individual in uh, school till he or she is 18 years old. So pre-pandemic, we already see there is a difference between this quantity and the measure that lays learning adjusted school of uh, years of school among ASEAN countries. So now with school closures during the pandemic, there is an ADB study that says that uh, this the school closures during the pandemic has resulted in loss of 35% percent of learning adjusted years of schooling, which is higher than the average of the developing countries in the region. So again, what is how ASEAN is trying to solve this issue. So similar to the ASEAN, uh, the healthcare system, we have the ASEAN Declaration on Human Resource Development. We also have ASEAN Declaration on Digital Transformation. Um, but personally, I see there are many gaps in this policy measures. Um, so of course, education is the responsibility of the national governments. But what is missing is the connection between the national government's ambition uh, to connect it with the ambition of forming an ASEAN community. And set up some regional policy targets that the national governments need to comply over medium to long term. Basic education is yet to be rigorously discussed in ASEAN documents and pandemic told us like when a situation like this comes, it's education sector as a whole that's affected not just higher education or university or technical education. Uh, Education as a whole is currently discussed to AEC characteristics of um, the mobility of skilled worker, uh, which I feel is limited because ASEAN economic community uh, talks about trade, investment and economic competitiveness. And we all know that better human quality, uh, which comes from the better education helps in the countries to deliver on these ambitions. Uh, regional cooperation need to discuss on how to improve the quality assurance system across all level of education in, in ASEAN countries. There should be non-paper written on the concept of lifelong learning or knowledge-based manufacturing. These are the terms used in the ASEAN economic community blueprint, but there are no clear direction. What does it mean? Are there any targets in the ASEAN at the regional level to support this uh, concept of lifelong learning or knowledge-based manufacturing? Also, ASEAN need to promote exchange program among students at all level. Of course, we will be going into the post pandemic. So we need to see how we can blend the online and the physical exchange programs among the students in ASEAN countries. Moving to the third strategic area of the framework document uh, of strengthening economic integration. I will talk briefly about three, four things, starting with from supply chain disruption, which I will also combine with trade facilitation, RCEP, and the tourism recovery. So looking at the supply chain disruption in Southeast Asia, uh, as was uh, spoken by the earlier speaker, even the keynote speech, the Southeast Asian countries, they face major disruption of production and supply chains. Uh, as lockdown measures led to factory, closure, uh, factory closures in many countries. 
So in the early phase of the pandemic, say in the major automotive manufacturers such as Mazda, Mitsubishi and Nissan, they all temporarily closed production in Thailand. Ford also suspended production in Thailand and Vietnam and Toyota in Indonesia and Thailand. ASEAN countries that are global value chain intensive manufacturing sector like electronics and apparels that got disrupted by lockdowns in China. Uh, and of course, many countries in ASEAN got affected by that. About 40 to 60% of electronics components for factories in Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam get sourced from, the, from China. And 55% of inputs for say apparel manufacturing in Cambodia, Myanmar, and Vietnam comes from China. So any localized lockdown in China will affect production in the ASEAN countries. There are also various trade measures imposed by major vaccine producing countries as they were giving more priority to domestic demand that have hampered global deployment of vaccines. And of course, we also observe geographic concentration of um, major manufacturers for say the personal protective equipment like gloves and uh, gloves and masks that were got vulnerable to the localized shocks in many countries, particularly in China. So I just showed you a broad way, like how many different kinds of supply chains ASEAN countries faced uh, during the height of the pandemic. Now, if I move to the trade facilitation, which I said will be, I will connect it with the supply chain also, because many of the cross-border supply chain need uh, efficient functioning of the uh, border measures. So, uh, of course, the importance of trade facilitation grew during the pandemic as the customs uh, faced uh, limited manpower because either they fell sick or there was the social distancing protocol that these agencies need to maintain. And there is also a long backlog of shipments in many ports causing delays for movement of essential goods. So there is this survey done by UNSCAP every two years uh, that shows how the countries are progressing uh, in implementing the trade facilitation measures. It combines both the WTO trade facilitation agreement initiative measures and the digital trade measures, uh, which UNESCAP has its own list of initiatives. And these trade facilitation measures are broadly categorized as transparency, formalities, institutional arrangement and cooperation, paperless trade, and cross-border paperless trade. So if we see the graph, we see that implementation varies uh, greatly by country in the region. Countries like uh, such as Singapore have average implementation rate of around 96%. And of course, this has grown from 88% in 2015. Whereas countries like Myanmar or Laos have no implementation rate. During the pandemic, we also heard and read about additional cooperation measures on trade facilitation. Uh, about two-thirds of the uh, APEC economies implemented electronic submission of trade-related documents and expedited uh, their some, uh, the customs procedure, uh, giving emphasis to the essential goods. So how do we see ASEAN cooperation in supply chain connectivity and trade facilitation? Uh, yes, of course, uh, the document, the frame, framework document does talk about ASEAN should intensify effort to implement measures for supply chain resilience, increase market competitiveness, develop in innovative and smart solutions. Uh, but I'm uh, yet to see what does it means, like how are we going to do that? What are the different um, mechanisms that the national economies are going to do to strengthen, uh, especially the supply chain connectivity? Uh, if you see from the trade facilitation, when I look at all the countries surveyed by UNSCAP, yes, I must say that ASEAN countries are a lot more advanced uh, in terms of uh, trade facilitation with the setup of this ASEAN single window that is uh, accepting digital signature or this exchange of Form D under the ASEAN Trade in uh, Goods Agreement. But of course, we need to advance the exchange of e-documents uh, much beyond this Form D to include uh, uh, other trade measures. Moving to the RCEP, uh, I will not go in much detail because RCEP needs a full one or webinar or one full conference, but I will only talk about the usefulness of RCEP at this moment. Of course, we all know RCEP is the mega regional agreement 
uh, keeping up the momentum of uh, trade and globalization in this environment of disruption and uh, creeping nation nationalism. The RCEP countries together account for approximately 20% of global mercantile trade, which is higher than the share of CPTPP, the other mega regional, and NAFTA. Uh, the share of RCEP economies in global trade has grown in the last two decades, you can see in the bottom left-hand side chart, showing its growing significance in, in global trade. Looking at another uh, indicator like the trade intensity index, uh, we can see that the, uh, the, the index of the RCEP countries in past years are greater than one. And there are much upside potential because the ASEAN countries that are all members of the RCEP are already trading intensely when compared to other regions uh, uh, across the world like EU27 and NAFTA. And uh, as we heard from Mr. Tan during his keynote speech, we are going to see supply chain shift post COVID. And I think RCEP uh, is already present there to help, help the economies to uh, move the supply chain closer, closer to home, maybe within ASEAN countries or among the East Asian countries. Uh, looking at the tourism sector, which is uh, bad, very badly hit uh, during COVID, the sector uh, constitutes around 14% uh, of region's GDP and another 14% of total employment in the region. Uh, in ASEAN countries, um, the, all the destinations, the wide array of tourist destinations attract around 143 million international tourists and uh, around 130 billion as tourist uh, receipts. Uh, and this is a very sizable pro uh, proportion when we see as in terms of the total visitors in Asia or say tourism receipts. So ASEAN covers around 38% of total visitors in Asia and its total earning is around 30% of Asia's tourism receipts uh, on over say 2015 to 2019. But in 2020, the pandemic slashed the tourist arrivals to ASEAN by 81% and tourism receipt by 79%. COVID-19 brought a number of risk, uh, risk to the forefront and these include concentration of source markets to Asia and uh, we were hearing from Hugbin just now that uh, China with its zero, zero tolerance pol this uh, policy uh, we may say, see like post-COVID recovery for tourism sector can be difficult. So we see a highly concentration of uh, source market in Asia there's predominance of air travel as mode of transport to visit ASEAN destination. And we also observe like the domestic travel uh, is inadequate for revenue from revenue perspective for ASEAN countries. Of course, the, the bottom right hand side shows that the share of domestic to total tourism spending has gone up in 2020, but this is not enough to cover for the international tourist uh, earnings. So recovery of tourism sector depends on planning at a three-step process, like it should be ASEAN-wide measures, there need to be country-level measures, and also there should be sector and subsector uh, specific measures. Uh, of course, ASEAN has uh, existing mechanism in tourism cooperation, uh, but we need to look at more at the industry-specific policies and health protocols, particularly to raise passenger confidence and to help business to function under clear guidelines. ASEAN countries should urgently consider a mutual vaccination and testing recognition scheme. Currently, some countries to encourage its own population to get vaccinated is saying that the, if you are getting vaccinated in this country, you will be subject to less quarantine. But this is discouraging travel more than compelling people to take vaccine in their home country. ASEAN countries should uh, step up and put in place the region-wide healthcare and safety protocols, develop standards and framework to facilitate recovery of Indian international travel. And going forward, a uh, big thing ASEAN countries should pay attention to sustainable tourism. And so this is basically paying attention to over tourism and overcrowding uh, in the tourism des uh, destination. And ASEAN countries has al already experienced the adverse effect of over tourism or overcrowding uh, in the case of Philippines Boracay or Thailand's Maya Bay in the past. So restricting the kind of uh, the number of tourists in a particular destination uh, to manage over tourism 
uh, aligns well with current pandemic situation as overcrowding of the tourism sites may not be possible in foreseeable future. Moving to the next aspect of this framework recovery document on the digital transformation. Uh, of course, COVID-19 accelerated digitalization of economies and societies. We saw children began attending classes uh, remotely. Employees were working from home. Firms were adopting digital business model. Of course, we have mobile application uh, that were developed for tracking and tracing. And there are research uh, using artificial intelligence and other technology to learn more about the virus and undertake research to come up with vaccine. So one thing I would like to propose is the post pandemic, we can see how we can use big data for more targeted policy making. So of course, big data is the large structure or unstructured data, data set of information that's normally generated by organization, peoples and machines. But this can provide very valuable insights into trends, behavior among people and prospects and can help governments to make uh, policy uh, policy uh, in policy formulation. This was already happening, say, in countries like Singapore and Thailand, uh, where um, the countries, uh, particularly for the tourism sector, where they are partnering with the online travel agents, telecommunication companies, financial services, uh, and tapping the big data to formulate and implement tourism-related policies. Uh, currently, digitalization can facilitate cross-border travel. The region can pilot on digital uh, travel certificate. Uh, ASEAN countries are already working for a stronger regulatory uh, requirement on, say, data privacy, cybersecurity, and others. So it can be expanded to, to the travel and the tourism industry also, uh, and also the healthcare sector. Of course, there are challenges uh, working with big data requires advanced technology and specialized skill, and uh, also strong legal and institutional framework. Um, so, and currently there is a significant shortage of skills in ASEAN countries to work on the big data. So going forward over medium term, ASEAN countries should start investing in ICT data analytics, education and training. Uh, there is also challenges in the terms of data sharing across jurisdiction. And also sometimes data storage is uh, limited to handful of organizations and private sector. There is also a significant drawback with the big data as digital footprint for poor and vulnerable may not be available. MS MSMEs may not be using uh, digital, uh, digital tools um, as widely as we expect them to do. So there are both advantages and uh, drawbacks in the, in the use of big data, but we can also have uh, use it where we need it and also address where there are the gaps, we can use different kind of policy formulation to uh, have a more inclusive uh, policy making. So this, I won't go through the slide much. This, is, this shows that ASEAN already has a digital integrated uh, integration framework. It also talks about uh, partnering with private sector to improve talent base, uh, e-commerce, MSMEs, uh, there is ICT infrastructure document under ASEAN Master Plan Connectivity. There is ASEAN Smart Cities Network. And we just heard from the keynote speech that we also have this uh, ASEAN Single Digital Roadmap. So there are the building blocks ready in ASEAN to move towards a digital economy. But currently, we are in very early stages. And we need to understand how the ASEAN countries are ready in terms of their own understanding of this or how much they are prioritizing this and how much is their capability in implementing all these measures. The so last Chita, aspect, yes, I'm finishing. Can you wrap up? Thank you. Yes. So last slide on the sustainable and resilient future. So uh, ASEAN already is talking about sustainable and resilient future, and it's tied up and measures are tied up to the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. But uh, we, ASEAN is talking about green recovery, green infrastructure, and uh, green, uh, green finance. But I think the definition and understanding of sustainability and resilience need to be broadened to take into account like the supply chain disruption or the disruption in education or healthcare sector that we saw recently doesn't happen in the future. 
we need to identify the vulnerabilities in the sectors and we can see how we need to identify how we can increase the capabilities in the sector in this sector through say policy making or facilitating private sector uh, to diversify their uh, investment in different economies so that we don't see a disruption of the similar order in the future i'll stop here thank you uh, thank you sanchita um, our next presenter is sebastian sebastian please proceed uh, thank you uh, casey um, and good morning everyone uh, let me just share my screen so good okay Great. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you to ISEAS and the Current and Our Foundation for inviting me to speak today. Um, like Dr. Lee mentioned, my name is Sebastian Cortez, and I'm Deputy Director at the Asian Trade Center, Singapore-based uh, policy research consultancy. Um, over the past year at the ATC, we have engaged in a series of projects that included analysis of digital trades and e-commerce policies in ASEAN, and also programming to work with small businesses across the region uh, to help them build more sustainable and resilient businesses through digital trade. Um, so today, uh, I want to take the opportunity to, I think, frame a lot of what uh, Minister Tan and the previous speakers have mentioned within the context of MSMEs uh, within ASEAN um, and the opportunities and challenges to ensure that they can take advantage of the benefits of digital trade. Um, so before I do all, well, I'll get started. So, um, as Minister Tan mentioned, um, ASEAN is the world's fastest growing digital economy. And according to IMF estimates, uh, this is the potential for it to grow up to one. Um, and according to last year's report uh, by Google, Temasek, and Bain on the economy of Southeast Asia, um, which already took into account the COVID-19 or the impact of the COVID-19 crisis, um, the digital economy or the internet economy in ASEAN is, is due to you know, grow of uh, 105 billion to 309 billion by 2025. That's on an average of 24% IE increase, uh, which is significant. Um, so with that framework in mind, uh, I think today I would like to address three separate types. How has and will the rise of the digital economy affect MSME competitiveness and MSME growth in the region? Um, and, and given that is this proportionate impact on small businesses in the region? Uh, what has been the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on MSMEs? And last, uh, to explore whether some of the economy level changes that I think uh, the previous speakers have outlined very well, whether it is uh, unilateral or the domestic level, or whether it is some of these broader frameworks that ASEAN has in place, whether those have or will address some of the needs that I'll be aligning on part two. So just to get started, um, uh, something that I think I would like to highlight before I go into this slide is that MSMEs represent over 90% of businesses in the region um, and therefore are the core at the center of the success of the region's economic recovery now and, and moving into the future. So, so they're really the center and, and, and they should be the focus of building a more inclusive economic recovery over the years to come. Uh, so when we are talking about digital economies or uh, digital technologies, uh, they enable MSMEs to operate um, in a term that we like to call like a more like a micro multinational um, with access to uh, e-commerce platform modes, digital payments tools, logistic solutions. Now, MSMEs within the region can operate with ease across geographies, tap into international supply chains, and connect with consumers, suppliers, and investors across the entire globe. Um, and before I sort of outline how digital technologies, the needs or challenges that MSMEs face, uh, something that we like to highlight is just a very simple framework to understand sort of MSME priorities or competitiveness. Uh, in working with MSMEs, it often comes down to three key factors. And the first one is time, the time it takes them to develop a product, and more importantly, the times it, it takes them to send that to a customer and receive a payment for that product. So being able to do that efficiently and at a um, fast rate really matters for them and it can mean whether they're competitive or not in a specific market. The second one is resources. Um, a lot of them operate in very thin margins. So uh, money that operate in very thin margins. So anything that increases or decreases the cost or their margin of being able to sell their products within our side of the country really matters for their competitiveness. And last is resources. So here you're thinking is their ability to be able to scale, right? So you often work with MSMEs that are able to obtain sellers in another country. However, 
uh, once they get a contract, they're not able to scale the production to be able to meet that demand. So the resources and the availability to the right infrastructure and the right manufacturing facilities matters a lot for them in order to, for them to be able to take advantage of e-commerce and digital trade. Um, and based on that framework, when we think about government or institutional reforms, that either facilitate or add obstacle to those factors will affect MSN growth. So if there's a government regulation that, you know, reduces the time, uh, improves their margin, increase their access to resources, it will increase. And on the other hand, if there's a government regulation that does the opposite, then it will likely affect MSME growth within, uh, our, within the region. Um, so when we think about their access to digital technologies, this means uh, e-commerce, marketing, access to more efficient manufacturing and production technologies, um, recent study conducted by us, you know, look, looked at uh, a model that, that showed that um, if an MSME brick and mortar were to digitalize completely, whether it was selling services or goods, it could increase 75% of its sales. It would decrease its export time by 29%. Um, it would decrease the cost of money by up to 40%. Um, it would decrease export costs by 82%. Um, and it would decrease the cost for service providers by 82%. Um, I won't go into detail of what goes into each of these and what that means, uh, but happy to answer any questions um, in the Q&A. So bearing in mind access to digital technologies, incredible opportunity that means operating in the region, then how do we contextualize that within COVID-19? Because what's become, what became clear uh, as, as the COVID-19 crisis was taking place is that uh, the pandemic and the accompanying economic crisis have been distinctly damaging to MSMEs uh, within the region. Um, based on a series of surveys that, that we run um, within the ATC, we, we found that almost 50% of, of MSMEs surveyed have less than a month or just a month of cash reserves, which means that uh, lockdown or the inability to sell their services could mean that they you know, go under or go bankrupt very easily. It also shows that nearly 30% percent of SMEs expect that they might have to lay off 50 percent or more of their workers um, so there was you know massive layoffs um, here in, in this particular box you see uh, an example uh, of a Vietnamese manufacturer um, where under extreme uh, financial pressure to maintain heavy investment needed to finance their orders um, and they were unable to obtain support from some of the local banks with low interest rates uh, and also to maintain financing onto demands levels rest to normal. So uh, as a result, they have to lay off 80% of their staff. Um, so very dire situation in access to capital. The last one is only 35% are confident and they will not have to lay off any other staff. So it's the, the COVID-19 has been critical for everybody for the economy. I think as Dr. Short has shown, you know, it has had significant economic impacts, um, but it has had an acute um, impact on small businesses. Um, and when we look at the government responses to the COVID-19, which is, are justifiable from a healthcare perspective, um, these have also led uh, to uh, doing the sales and general promoting demand that have exacerbated existing supply chain bottlenecks that MSMEs already face. So the, so the first one is access to transport solutions, especially when you look to these least developed economies in the region. Um, some of the larger freight forwarders or logistics service providers don't operate in some regions. So a lot of businesses, because they cannot move, couldn't actually ship their things because um, whether it's UPS or FedEx are operating in a region outside of theirs. Um, the second one is still the need for some physical documentation. So even though the region has made significant strides to the digitalization of documentation, six every provider still copies of things like airway bills, which meant that under the pandemic, MSMEs couldn't travel. Uh, to present the airway bill, so they were not able to actually ship some of the goods um, that they were selling. Um, and the last one uh, is the high cost of transportation. So I think Dr. Shu highlighted how freight, co freight costs um, into China, out of China, have increased significantly over the past year. Um, and so freight and freight and, and air rates for MSMEs, I think, uh, in a lot of uh, circumstances, have made it almost prohibitive for them to be able to ship at any decent margin. So, so, so as a result, um, a lot of them are, are stuck. And even when they've been able to find new clients, new opportunities in overseas markets and even in domestic markets, there's still key supply chain bottlenecks that really do not allow them to fulfill those orders or to fulfill those orders in a way that is profitable, um, especially when they don't have a lot of cash at hand 
you know, to be able to find to, to finance or or provide collateral um, or or invest um, in the resources needed to meet that demand. So, um, of course, and, and and I think as speakers have highlighted in in in, in their um, the region has done, I think, uh, a very good job at trying to figure out a ways to address some of these key challenges, um, either through uh, domestic level reforms, through initiatives like the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework, um, and through initiatives to make uh, digitalization, you know, moving forward uh, a lot more inclusive and, and to ease and, and, and sort of flatten some of the bottlenecks that are already highlighted. So here in the slides, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to provide a few examples of how those uh, economic level changes have in fact addressed those MSME needs. Um, and where I'm not gonna say they've fallen short, but where they could do more to ensure that it's easier for MSMEs to trade across the region. So um, the first one is the inconsistent treatment of low value achievements. So um, uh, within the region, um, a lot of countries have uh, sort of the minimus or low value achievement rules, uh, but those vary significantly across countries and the eligibility requirements, uh, the value of the shipments um, and the thresholds are very different, uh, which means that in some circumstances, an MSME will have to pay VAT slash GST and customs duties and in some circumstances they haven't depending on the market. So that means that the, the inconsistency across makes it very difficult for MSMEs to be able to, to operate across markets and to factor in tax costs across markets. Ideally, um, the, value, the, the threshold for low value shipments will be similar across the region. And I know ASEAN, ASEAN Place is in, uh, it's, it's in progress or, or it's, it's meaning to develop a program for low value shipments because that would in fact allow a lot of small businesses to just find demand and be able to send that across multiple countries um, you know, without incurring uh, taxes on shipments that are, you know, usually very, very, very low. Um, the second one is, is limited freight capacity. Um, something that I think uh, was, was mentioned by one of the previous speakers is the fact that a lot of MSMEs may depend on, on China on a specific market as a key supplier, right? So uh, a lot of MSMEs that manufacture in ASEAN actually source from within ASEAN or from within the region, from within China. Um, and things like the pandemic, that make cut access to those key sourcing uh, locations and then they are unable to manufacture anything um, and something that i think has been part of the discussion lately is this idea of supply chain resilience and diversifying suppliers and having uh sort of risk assessments of your supply chain and optimization and at the mnc level where there is a robust supply chain team a compliance team that is very doable uh but for an msme that you know, has depended on a single supplier over the past years and have, may not have the capacity to be able to maintain or develop relationships with suppliers across multiple geographies. Stopping trade uh, from one country can be very detrimental. So because MSMEs do not have the resources to in fact diversify and establish multiple su supplier relations, it's very important to in, try to ensure that when pandemics take place or, or when any type of obstacles to regional supply chains do in fact take place, um, that uh, governments to take into account how those stoppages might impede their smaller businesses from manufacturing the products that they need to survive and subsist. Um, the second one is going back to the framework is, is time and compliance. So um, what are some of the things that are making either time or, or, or compliance more onerous for MSMEs? Um, and one of them is uh, the rise of different types of indirect and direct taxation on digital uh, goods and services. So governments within ASEAN and across the region are coming up with uh, new ways to tax digital products and services, whether it's through uh, GST or, or VAT, so good and services and, and value added taxes on digital services and products um, or through direct taxation. And, and the issue with, with this is it's not that indirect taxation is bad in itself, but that it's that the circumstances in which it's applied and the requirements to be able to sell their products across different markets vary, right? So some, in some cases, you need to establish local presence. In some cases, the rates are higher than the others. In some cases, the rates are subject to the minimus, and in some cases, they're not. So if you're a small company with, you know, five to 10 employees, and you're trying to manage orders across five countries, and every single one of those five countries have completely different requirements, then it's very difficult to manage that. Um, and I think uh, 
existing frameworks within us and I think provide a, a great opportunity to try to figure out a, a common approach to indirect taxation and the taxation of digital products that would ensure that the onus on companies, especially MSMEs, is, is less. Uh, the second one is inconsistencies in paperless trade practices and standards. So key issue is that during the pandemic, a lot of governments move forward in trying to digitize and lower paper requirements and accepting things like e sanitary certificates or electronic certificates of origin. The issue is that in a lot of cases, they were not applied consistently between countries. So there were cases where a government had in place electronic phytosanitary certificates by exporting the exporting country, but then the importing country did not accept e phyto certificates. So then they, they needed the paper copy. So MSMEs were caught in the place where one country asked them to do e phyto and then when the shipment went, they were asking for a physical FIDA certificate. So again, highlighting that individual country efforts to digitize trade are great, um, but a consistent approach is needed uh, to ensure that that's actually implemented in a way that makes it easier for companies to trade and you know doesn't make compliance costs higher. Um, and because I'm, I'm running out of time, I think the last one that I just wanted to highlight and something that we've been sort of exploring a lot recently is, is payments and how difficult it is to manage cross-border digital payments in the region. So despite incredible progress in digital payment solutions within ASEAN countries, right? So if you go to Myanmar, Cambodia, Lao, you see that there's a lot of mobile payment platforms that MSMEs use you know, on a daily basis. But once you need to either pay your supplier in another country or you need your customer in another country to pay you, then the obstacles are much larger. Um, and we find that in most cases, MSMEs just still use bank transfers either because the solutions available do not suit them or they're too expensive, um, or because maybe there's a solution available, but the client is not comfortable using it because it's a new solution, or because uh, new uh, fintech solutions don't have a proof of concept, so they don't trust them. So we, we found that MSMEs, especially in least developed economies within the region, lack access to cross-border payment solutions. Um, and like I said, many do in fact still employ bank transfers. So I, I think I just wanted to say this framework can you know quickly highlight all these issues to show that Yes, ASEAN has and is making a lot of progress in trying to figure out a common approach, common institutional framework to ensure that the digital economy grows and grows in a way that is inclusive. However, they need to ensure, and I think uh, Sanchita made this point in her presentation, they need to ensure that that common approach is concrete um, and it actually addresses some of the issues that make it difficult for, for small companies, especially companies in a post-COVID environment, to actually trade. Um, so I think I applaud ASEAN for the efforts that he has made to date, um, and, and I look forward to seeing how either the implementation of the Comprehensive Recovery Framework, the implementation of the e-commerce agreement, um, the ASEAN Agreement on e-commerce, and, and last, uh, Minister Tan mentioned, uh, the negotiation and eventual implementation of a digital economy agreement uh, will um, address some of these issues so that uh, the growth of the digital economy uh, and its benefits um, actually trickles down and, and ensures that MSMEs who are the ones that are meant to benefit the bulls um, actually can take advantage of those benefits. Um, yeah, so so thank you again uh, for the opportunity uh, to present today and I look forward to uh, your questions.